Okay, this is probably the most important video I'm going to cover in the entire series, and that is how to find the loop invariant. So, if you want to prove a piece of code with the while loop, you need to find an invariant p. So, what, what, what's an invariant? Uh, it's a predicate that satisfies three properties. So, it has to satisfy the property that if the loop condition b, which is this statement here, the statement here is my b, if the loop condition is true and p is true before you run the code, p should still be true after you run the code. So that is, p is invariant of the code s. So this whole thing here is s. Sometimes called the body. Okay? So this whole triple here needs to be provable. The second thing you require is that once the code halts, p needs to be strong enough to imply the post condition. So that is, P and not B together, both of these things imply the post condition. And the third condition we require is that P is weak enough to be implied by the precondition. So assuming the precondition should be able to prove P. You need three these three things because if you don't, when you try to do the proof, you'll find that either you can't actually prove this to then use the while rule, or you won't be able to use precondition strengthening or you won't be able to use post-condition weakening, right? You just need all three of these things. So how do you find the invariant? Well, unfortunately, there is no hard and fast rule. You can't just crank the handle of the algorithm and receive an answer for P. You have to sort of just, by trial and error almost, find a P that's satisfying these three properties. Now, you can sort of intelligently guess by running the code for a few iterations and see if you can find a relation between the variables that makes this property true. So here we've got some code, and the idea is this code is supposed to compute um, the factorial of a number. So the precondition is that n is greater than or equal to 0, and i is 0, and t is 1. And what does the code do? While i is strictly less than n, it increases i by 1, and then multiplies t by i. It continues doing this in a loop until this condition fails. And then hopefully at the end, t is equal to n factorial. And as a reminder, n factorial is defined to be 1 times 2 times blah, 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 times n. So n factorial is a product of the first n numbers. Okay? So let's see if we can find the invariant. So I'll draw myself a little table here. Number of loops so far. The value of i and the value of t. Um, I've got three variables here, but n doesn't actually change because... Um, there's no code here that modifies n. n is just a constant, so we can basically ignore n for the moment. Okay, so after executing zero loops, that is after not running the code at all, so before you run the code, what's the value of i and t? Well, they're given to us in the preconditions. It looks like i is equal to zero and t is equal to one. So far, so good. All right, so we're on the first loop of the code. And what's the first loop of the code going to do? It's going to increase i by 1 and then multiply the current value of t by the current value of i. So the current value of i is now 1. 1 times 1 is 1. Okay, so far so good. Let's run the code again. So in the second loop iteration, i increases by 1, so i is now 2. t becomes 1 times 2, which is 2. Okay, let's run it again. Third loop iteration, i is increased by 1, and t becomes 2 lots of 3, which is 6. And we'll do one more. Fourth iteration, increase i by 1, and then 4 by 6 is 24. Okay, and so on. So we want to conjecture a pattern, some sort of pattern we can write down that relates i and t, such that this predicate is true. Well, let's have a look here. I counts up by 1 each time, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And T seems to have this interesting pattern, 1, 1, 2, 6, 24. The next one would be 24 by 5 is 120. If you sort of look at this for a bit, you might recognize these as factorial numbers, right? 0 factorial, 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 3 factorial, 4 factorial, and so on. So it looks like a good choice for the invariant might be t is equal to i factorial, right? Because that seems to be true while we're running the code. It seems to be the case that if it's true before we're in the code, it's still true after the next loop has occurred, which 
indicates that this property one is probably going to hold. Okay. So first off, we'll look at rule two. Um, is this strong enough to imply the post? Because this is certainly true, but is it going to be strong enough for what we need? So if this is my P and not B, well, B is I strictly less than N, so not B is I is greater than or equal to N. Will this imply T is equal to N factorial? Well, if T is equal to I factorial and I is bigger than or equal to N, it might not be the case that T is N factorial because I could be really, really big, right? So this, this won't work alone. Uh, our post condition is too weak. We need something stronger. So T equals I factorial, that was certainly along the right track. What other conditions can I place on my loop invariant? Well, each time I run the code, it should be the case that I is strictly less than N. Because if this condition is violated, then the code wouldn't run, right? So it should be the case before I run the code, if I was less than or equal to N, then hopefully I is less than or equal to N afterwards, assuming the code runs in the first place, okay? So if I add the condition, I is less than or equal to N, so now this whole thing is my P, then assuming the code runs, so together with B, what was B? I is strictly less than N. Um, this whole condition here, if you assume it's true before you run the code, then this condition here will still hold after you run the code. So we'll show that in a moment. But importantly, the second condition should hopefully now hold. If I have P, so T equals I factorial, and I less than or equal to N, this whole thing is P, and not B, so I is, it's false to say I is strictly less than N, that means I is greater than or equal to N. That should be a not. Whoops. That should imply T is equal to N factorial. What does it? Well, if T is equal to I factorial, and I is less than or equal to N, and I is greater than or equal to N, these two conditions here means I is equal to N, together with T equals I factorial means T equals N factorial. So this condition does indeed hold. So rule two is good. Uh, rule three does the precondition n greater than or equal to 0, and i equals 0, and t equals 1. Does that imply p? What's our p? t equals i factorial, and i is less than or equal to n. Well, if n is greater than or equal to 0, and i is equal to 0, then this condition definitely holds. And if i equals 0, that means i factorial is 0 factorial is 1 and t is equal to 1. So it looks like this condition holds. So it looks like rule 3 and rule 2 are good. Now we just got to check rule 1. So it's good to informally do a sketch of rule 1 before actually cranking up the whole logic proof because it's easier to check informally if it's false and once you've checked informally that it's true then you can do the formal proof. So let's just informally show that this is true. So p t equals i factorial and i is less than or equal to n uh, for the record, doing this informal proof is not at all necessary, but it's good to just like check in the margin this is true before you attempt to prove it. Because if you try to attempt to prove a false thing, you're just going to get stuck. Okay? So this is P. And B, I is strictly less than N. My code, increase I by 1, increase T, or multiply T by I. My post condition is just P by itself. So T is equal to I factorial and i is strictly less than n. Okay? Does this hold? Well, let's just assign some values to i and n and t. And these will be arbitrary variable. These will be arbitrary values under these assumptions. So I'm going to let t equal x, i equal y, n equal z, with these constraints. So that means, what does that mean? It means x is equal to y factorial, and if i is less than n, that means y is less than z. And i is strictly less than n, so that means well, y is strictly less than z. Because this condition here makes this condition redundant. Okay? So if we run the code, what happens? So i gets one bigger, so i is now equal to y plus 1. And t is the old value of t, which is x, times 
a new value of i. So i just got updated. We have to use the new value of i. So t is now going to be x times y plus 1. Okay? What's our post condition? t is equal to i factorial. So it should still be the case that x times y plus 1 is equal to y plus 1 factorial. And it should also be the case that i is less than or equal to n. So it should also be the case that y plus 1 is less than or equal to rz. Because n was equal to z. Really? Okay, yep, that's fine. So how can we check that this is true? Well, I can just evaluate this. y plus 1 factorial is y plus 1 times y factorial. And y factorial was equal to x. So that means we have x times y plus 1 is equal to y plus 1 times x. Cool, that checks out. And I need y plus 1 is less than or equal to z. Well, if y is strictly less than z, and if I increase y by 1, it's less than or equal to z. So that means this property holds true as well. Cool, so informally this looks like it ought to be true. So the next thing we have to do is formally prove this statement and then use this to formally prove this code here using the while rule, okay? So I'll be the next video.